We haven't been able to stop stealing. We haven't been able to stop uh, domestic abuse. We haven't been able to stop murder. How do you expect to stop terrorism? Mass murder is a crime. It's always been a crime in Australian law. It's a crime everywhere to kill people. There have always been laws that make it an offence to kill people, to threaten them, to have dangerous stuff, to conspire to do this. We just don't need new laws. What is terrorism is possibly one of the most significant questions in the social sciences. Terrorism itself is one of the most controversial and contested of these because it's so politically loaded. I would define terrorism as political violence against civilians, but Australian law defines terrorism as political violence. And that's the difference between me and Australian law, and that's why I don't like it. It's a really good question, uh, how, how to define terrorism. Famously, we've always said one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. The idea that um, um, one person's terrorist is, is another person's freedom fighter, I think is actually quite true. And I say that not because I, I support any particular uh, terrorist um, um, organisation, but it goes back to the causes of why people become terrorists in the in the first place. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter is possibly one of the worst cliches that's out there. Now it's true that, you know, people view conflicts very, very differently. But one of the things about terrorists is that terrorists are deliberately targeting civilians and non-combatants. One of the main drivers of terrorism are people's reactions to military conflicts, whether it be occupation, whether it be an invasion to a particular country, etc. And this isn't just with the Islamists. If we look at some of the stories about the so-called, you know, major freedom fighters, these were people who were fighting against uh, Nazi occupation. They were taking out Nazi soldiers. They weren't they weren't planting bombs where they were going to take out women and children. I think the future of Australian anti-terrorism law is bleak. We've got too much of it, it's poorly conceived, it's at odds with constitutional values, it has bad effects on part of the community, and there are other ways we could go about criminalising mass murder. Terrorism is uh, a crime. And if we look at terrorism as a crime, we've had hundreds and thousands of years of trying to create disincentives for people to engage in crime. One of our um, research participants in a conflict-affected community in Indonesia where also one of the, the major terrorist leaders, Santoso, was captured and killed uh, in 2016. These women told us, if you want to understand the security situation, don't ask the government, don't ask the military, ask us. So in the fight against terrorism, I think education is our most powerful weapon. Men, or women might be involved in a terrorist network, and so their children will then go to that school that is funded by that terrorist network, and they will receive the curriculum that is mandated by that type of school, and so that's the education that the child receives, and that's the community that they're around. With a team of researchers in the Center for Gender, Peace and Security, um, we've been really interested in exploring the gendered nature of terrorist violence. We've taken the view that only once you recognise that both men and women are capable of conducting violence in the name of a terrorist or extremist cause, can you also recognise the agency of, of women and men in preventing or countering 
that violence. And in recent research in Indonesia, we were actually able to document a whole range of different individual and collective activities that women are engaged in uh, in, in trying to counter uh, and prevent extremist attitudes and extremist behaviour, which they also see as leading ultimately to, to violence. So what is going to be more effective in the future, education or the military? Definitely education. Many of these women religious leaders pointed to the fact that in the Quran, jihad can only be committed on the approval of the mother. So that if you're going to uh, engage in terrorism, you actually have to seek out your mum's permission. So this provides a really important uh, kind of countering mechanism within Islam, which is kind of religiously justified. And so therefore engaging in religious discourses and supporting women's religious leadership is kind of a, a crucial way to prevent extremism. When we look at, you know, radicals throughout history, the suffragettes were radicals, and thank God they did what they did. So radicalism, radicalization need not necessarily lead us down uh, the path of destruction. Even today, academics can really agree on the definition of radicalization. Uh, you know, what is it and how has it happened? And that's simple, because it is an individual phenomenon. It's not a community phenomenon. And therefore, if it's an individual phenomenon, the best people that are able to deal with it are those closest to the individual. Now, each individual reacts and behaves in different ways. Is it a mental health issue? Is it a drug issue? Is it an isolation issue, alienation issue, discrimination issue, unemployment issue, a combination? What is it, a rebel with a cause, a rebel without a cause? People become involved in this type of politics because it's transformative. It takes them from someone who's living a mundane existence and they can kind of rewrite the narrative and cast themselves as the hero. And this is what we found with so many of, of the studies that we've looked at in Australia and overseas. These, you know, kind of everyday people who decide to take a stand for X cause and in so doing, they take it upon themselves the willingness to possibly engage in violence or, you know, take a very strong stance uh, against, against the state. In terms of terrorism and feeling more hope with the future, I definitely feel that it is through building relationships with others who might be different than yourselves. There is hope, but it is when people silo themselves off and they become, they, they operate in an echo chamber, then that, that worries me. We have overcome many racial divisions in the country. We've created a great pluralist democracy. I worry that terrorism is the pressure point that maybe could undo some of those achievements. I think it's important to understand that we as a nation are probably one of the leading lights and leading examples uh, in the world today of managing diversity simply because we do have a national agenda for a multicultural Australia. We have a solid foundation to be able to manage that diversity. The fear of terrorism and terrorism makes everybody a little bit more on edge, a little bit more divided, a little bit more siloed. People tend to stay within their own networks. They don't reach out a lot. There's, they're, they're not interested in interfaith dialogue. They're not interested in community building and so I think it brings people into kind of tight circles. Terrorism is having an effect on our local Australian Muslim community but not only in Australia and I, that's a worldwide phenomenon. What I can see here in Australia though is that there's a very proactive engagement with the Australian Muslim community and the wider community to dispel those myths and to dispel those fears through a whole range of interactions and work that's happening and, and I think that's a very positive sign. We have a great deal of outreach uh, from our centre and our basic motto is that you can't understand terrorism or ways in which to uh, combat terrorism uh, from behind the desk. The really exciting thing about doing research in a, in a social media age means that we have a huge opportunity to not only influence um, opinion leaders and policy makers in Australia, but we also can influence opinion makers and policy makers all around the world. But sometimes that distance, that stepping back is important because that creates the space in the breathing room to think about new things and to explore new ideas. If you come to Monash as a student, my expectation as a teacher or a supervisor or a mentor will be you'll come here and be an independent thinker. If you want to just come here and have someone tell you what to think by reading out of a book, you've come to the wrong place.